Hello, I'm Judy Woodruff, and it is my great pleasure to be spending some time with Dame Louise Richardson, who is about to become the 13th president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Louise, it's wonderful to be talking with you. It's a pleasure. There's so much to talk to you about, but let's start with this. You are a political scientist. You specialized in the study of terrorism, but of course you've studied much more broadly than that. You are returning to live in America after 14 years, seven years as vice chancellor of St. Andrews in Scotland, and most recently as vice chancellor at the University of Oxford. This is a big question. What does the world look like to you right now as you embark on this new job? Well, it is a big question, and I think the answer is very different than it would have been a few years ago. Uh, the world is a frightening place at the moment, what with the after effects of the pandemic, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the daily accumulating evidence of the ravages of climate change, um, and the fragility of democracy being exposed. So the world is a, a tough place at the moment, um, and yet um, I'm a perennial optimist. So you were taking over this great institution, one of the great philanthropic institutions in the world, the Carnegie Corporation, at a time when we are still in the middle of a pandemic. You've had experience at uh, the University of Oxford uh, with the development of a vaccine there. What is your perspective at this point on this pandemic as you take over Carnegie? Well, I think there are many lessons from the pandemic. The first is that we, we cannot afford to ignore uh, risks that we know are facing us, things like antimicrobial resistance, things like climate change. The pandemic, for all its difficulties and the tragedies that occurred as a consequence, really showed just what science could do. The fact that we went from nothing to several workable vaccines in a year is pretty spectacular, a real testament to the power of the human spirit, the human intellect, and indeed to, to global collaboration among scientists. So we showed what we can do, but we should have been better prepared than we were. There's the science and certainly the public health aspect mm -hmm. of this pandemic, but there's also the human piece of it. I mean, as you've experienced it, you're, you're moving to New York City, uh, moving back to the United mm -hmm. States. How do you think we've all sort of taken on board what's happened in this pandemic? I think we've been really shaken by the pandemic. And unfortunately, so much of our strength as a community comes from relationships with one another. And yet during the pandemic, we were forced to separate from one another. And so that was damaging. And then on the educational front, I think we've gone back years in terms of the work that had been done to reduce inequalities in education. There's so many kids, school is such a wonderful opportunity. I think the pandemic exposed the deep inequalities in our society in, in a way that was really quite tragic. And I think now our work is really cut out for us to try to redress the, the loss of years of, of education. I've been reminded uh, a number of times recently how today's college students, many of them were born mm -hmm. after 9-11. Yeah. And I think you've said that your worldview is different from that of your three mm -hmm. children. What did you mean by that? Well, by that I meant I grew up in rural Ireland, and Irish history is a long story of oppression by, by Britain, in which the good guys usually lose the battles. Whereas my children grew up in America, where they just believed in progress. The virtue of uh, the US was just on question, and that was a very different perspective. I think American children today might have a different perspective than even my children have. Because, because of the impact of 9-11, because of the impact of um, the economic crisis in 2008, because of Black Lives Matter. Let's go back, um, talk a little bit about what it was like in County Waterford, as you said, mm -hmm. Southeast mm -hmm. Ireland. You were one of seven, mm -hmm. um, three brothers, three sisters, raised in the same house as your mother and your grandmother. Right. You were the first in your family to go to college. Tell us what Louise was like as a little girl and what life was like. Well, Louise was a tomboy because I had an older brother and he seemed to get all the advantages, so that uh, always annoyed me. So uh, <laughs> I was a tomboy early on. But it was, it was an idyllic childhood, really, growing up in a small seaside town where we just ran free, roamed free all day, every day, and you knew everyone. There was just one local 
convent school for girls and one that the brothers ran for boys. You walked to school, you walked home and had your lunch, and you walked back after lunch. I believe birth order is very important in one's development, and being second of seven, I think it's had a huge impact on me. If you're one of seven kids, you know you're not the center of the universe. <laughs> you have no illusions about that. And everything you want has to be negotiated with your siblings, with the others with whom you're sharing a bed, sharing a bedroom. But I would say the expectations of women or girls were, were utterly different than they were for boys. The expectations of my brothers so different from my own. I, I once asked my father, what are your ambitions for your four daughters? And he stopped and he hadn't, he, he hadn't thought about it before. And, and he, after a while he said, well, that at least one enter the convent and that none end up on the shelf, <laughs> by which he meant unmarried. My father is an absolutely wonderful human being, so I don't mean that as a criticism. It was just the view of people of his generation. So there was absolutely no expectation that I would do anything other than get married. But I, I read a lot, and I, much as I loved the place, I wanted to leave. So um, you flew the coop, so to yes. speak, and, and uh, we, we see what happened later. You, um, in your book, What Terrorists Want, Understanding the Enemy, Containing the Threat, published about 15 years ago, you write that you came from a background that has produced many terrorists, mm -hmm. and you've spent your career trying to understand mm -hmm. them. Talk about that. Well, yes, I grew up in rural Ireland, close to a Gaeltacht, which is where Irish is the le medium of instruction. I was a passionate Irish speaker. I, in fact, I spoke it in preference to speaking English. Reading about Irish history, the version we learned at school was such a one-sided version. It was real sympathy for Irish republicanism. Yeah. And, uh, and so when I got to Trinity College, where I studied history, but Trinity was a Protestant institution. Most of the professors at the time were, were, were British, not Irish. And I learned an entirely different version of Irish history. And I became fascinated by how two sets of people, well-meaning, decent, good people, could have diametrically imposed interpretations of the same historical event mm -hmm. in this tiny little island. When I came to America to study terrorism, I just felt the literature was terrible because it just saw terrorists as one-dimensional bad guys and psychopaths. Mm. And I thought, it's much more complicated than that. How do these people, these teachers I knew, who were warm, kind, good parents, good teachers, upstanding members of the community, and yet decide to join a terrorist group to commit atrocities that violate every ethical code known to man, how do we understand that? So I felt the literature was wrong in being so oversimplified. I felt it's, it's much more complicated. You know, I was subject to some criticism for this yeah. effort to try to understand the enemy because yeah. people confuse that with trying to support them, but actually not at all. I think one has to understand them if you want to counter them effectively. There's a story about how when you, when you first came to America, philanthropy played such a big role. In your life. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would not have the education I have had without uh, the support of generous philanthropists. I first came to America on a scholarship from the Rotary Foundation, and I was completely taken with the meritocratic ethos, the can-do attitude, the fact that you could be smart and it was cool, which it really wasn't, uh, certainly <laughs> as a girl in where I came from. Uh, and I really loved that. So. Um, I went back to Trinity and resolved that I was going to come back to America for graduate school again. I got another scholarship to come back to America, first for a master's degree, and then yet another scholarship to Harvard to get a PhD. So there was absolutely no question I could have afforded any of that. Undergraduate education was relatively exp inexpensive, so I worked two jobs. I paid my own way through undergraduate. I worked shov shoving books in the library uh, every morning, six mornings a week, early in the morning before the library opened in Trinity College Dublin. Yeah, yeah. And then I worked as a cocktail waitress four nights a week yeah. um, in the Birmingham Hotel in Dublin. And then I was able to work during the holidays. So I could afford to finance my own undergraduate education. But for graduate school, it was fully financed by, by generous. Um, so you didn't have generous. to work at the same time? Well, I did, you were I did actually work as well always, just because if you don't come from means, you never have confidence that there will be money there if you need it. So, so yes, I always had lots of extra jobs as well, um, just because you never felt secure. But it, now you've got all these skills under your belt. Absolutely. <laughs> I am the best waitress. <laughs> so you have been, uh, it goes without saying, the first 
woman vice chancellor at St. Andrews and of the University of Oxford, mm -hmm. you're now the first woman to lead the Carnegie mm -hmm. Corporation of New York. You said that you hope for the day when we won't even make a big deal mm -hmm. out of the fact mm -hmm. first. But do you think such a time is actually going to come? Oh, I think it is, definitely. Um, I mean, it's taken a lot longer than I would have liked or any of us, I think, expected. I mean, women have been going to university at mass rates since the 70s, and yet every profession you look at is shaped like a pyramid. But if you think of my mother's generation, what I have achieved would have been inconceivable in her generation. And so I really look forward to the day when you know, my daughters can compete with other women, and it's just not an issue. We will feed more and more women at the top levels of universities and public broadcasting corporations and industries and, yeah. and indeed governments. It is taking far longer than it should have, but I think we will get there. You've been in education mm -hmm. your entire professional mm -hmm. life. What makes philanthropy interesting to you right now? Oh, well, because the needs are so great. Yeah. Yeah, there are very real problems in, in each, in the city, in this country, and indeed globally. Governments have vast resources, but there are also, as we know, partisan. And to have, have the flexibility uh, for philanthropists to see a problem and to be able to step in and do something about it quickly without any partisanship, I think it's more important than ever. How, is, how do you think running a foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, is, is going to be different from running an educational <laughs> institution? But I love the idea that I will know everybody who works here. And then, again, you know, I'm a powerful believer in the, the power of community, of people working together. So if you've got 100 people working together, it's much easier to figure out who you want to collaborate right. beyond the group uh, and, I think, to, to get things done. I want to ask you about something you, you've written and spoken about, and that is civil discourse and how we treat one another uh, in, in our communities and speaking across political divides right now. We are in a very divided time in the United States. How do you, as a political scientist, look at this? You've been watching it from mm -hmm. overseas and now you're here. What do, you, what do you see? It's horrifying to see this breakdown in civil discord, to, to see this polarization in, in this country that I love. We're, we're seeing um, it to a lesser extent in, in other countries, but the U.S. seems to be in the forefront. and. and I think it's deeply troubling, and I think I very much hope that foundations will get together to, to work to, to try to reclaim the center, because the center ground is, is where we make progress. The Augustinian precept, audi alterum partem, you know, listen to the other side. That should be our motto. I remember one of the lines in your address at the Oxford Union was to that effect. Um, you haven't gotten a a good education unless you've been disabused of everything uh, you've ever thought, at, at least that you begin to question. question. Yes. You have to, you have to listen to the other point of view, and if you disagree with it, try to change their mind, but above all you've got to be open to having your own mind changed too. You called social media, and I'm quoting, the pillory of modern times, I and mean, you talked about binary choices. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by all that? Well, I meant um, seeing the world in black and white. And actually, this goes back to my study of terrorism, because the one characteristic that terrorists invariably share is seeing the world in black and white, good and evil. I think we should get out of this binary thinking. The world is complicated. And in terms of social media? Well, yes. Our question. kids spend their time on computers where they like, dislike, thumbs up, thumbs down, which really encourages this, again, binary thinking. And the notion of the pillory, when somebody did or said something that was objectionable, they were held up for public opprobrium and, and ridiculed, and, and that's what's happening now on social media. Yeah, I'm a passionate defender of free speech, but this kind of toxic abuse of trolling, which often can lead to self-harm, we don't have a handle on it, and I think we need to. I was really struck by this metaphor because I'm thinking, it, it, it really it's all about there's nothing in the middle. Yes. I mean, it's either yes. this or that and nothing in yes. between. There's no room for nuance, mm -hmm. for compromise. Mm -hmm. There's that wonderful quote from Yeats, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it right, the center cannot hold. The good lack all conviction and the bad are filled with passionate intensity. 
the center cannot hold. I think that's where we're getting to. One of your many accomplishments at Oxford was, was creating greater access, and you've touched mm -hmm. on this, Louise, mm -hmm. to higher education mm -hmm. among people who are disadvantaged, mm -hmm. who haven't had the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the things that the late Queen Elizabeth cited when she um, appointed you Dame Commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Uh, and that was not very long ago. Yeah, there there's, remains lots of social inequality in, in, in Britain, and including in Britain higher education. But I think we've made some real strides, and I'm enormously proud of that. I mean, we've gone from 10% of kids from deprived background to 23% in seven years. So it shows what you can, what you can accomplish when you, when you try, and uh, when you marshal people behind a, a goal that they share. And I can rattle off all the statistics, but the statistics don't actually capture just the extraordinary yeah. gift of a transformed life. I mean, how, do you, how do you quantify that? I, I saw some of those statistics. They're just so impressive, the changes that have taken place. It's also an enormous problem. How can private philanthropy make a dent in it, do you think? Well, I think the problem there is actually bigger than private philanthropy. It's falling off the educational ladder much early on. You know, we need to invest in education right at the very beginning and keep that investment. Andrew Carnegie, mm -hmm. uh, among many things, he was among the ultra-rich who, I mean, in the vein of what you've been, been saying, acknowledged that economic inequality uh, was a problem in his, mm -hmm. in his time. Um, it eventually prompted him to give away his fortune. You know, we're still having these conversations, and yet people, you have people like Andrew Carnegie who gave away a lot of money, but people are still skeptical about philanthropy. What do you say to those who wonder what foundations and organizations like the Carnegie Corporation do? Well, I think they should judge us by our work. I mean, we should be able to point to what we have done with this legacy we've gotten and, and the improvements we've made, and if we can't, we're doing something wrong. And I do think we have a real responsibility to be serious about what we do and ensure that we are, are being effective. You've had time to examine Andrew Carnegie's legacy as a member of the board and now the president. What do you think his legacy is? What, is, what did he accomplish? Oh my, I think his, his book, A Gospel of Wealth, is just so important. Carnegie thought about his wealth and mm -hmm. what his responsibilities were. That you know, wealth is not to feed your ego, it's to feed the poor, it's to feed the hungry, and to, to help those who, who, who need help. There is a lot of inexorable distribution of wealth. One could absolutely argue that nobody should have that much wealth, but the reality is many people do, and um, let's encourage those who do to spend it improving the lot of others, as, as Andrew Carnegie did. So here at the Carnegie Corporation, as you look at the world, as you look mm -hmm. at what's out there, the mm -hmm. challenges are almost mm -hmm. endless. Yeah. How do you think at this point about what an organization like Carnegie, with mm -hmm. a lot of resources but mm -hmm. limited, yeah. can do on its own and in combination right. with other philanthropic organizations to make a difference in the world? How do you see that? Well, I think that is, that's actually the task. I hope to spend my first few months consulting with our board and with the staff, just questioning everything we do and saying, are we targeting it this correctly? Should we be more disciplined? Should we shift our areas of focus? You know, what you want to do is find areas where other people are not helping out, find a niche that, that needs help, that other people are not pouring money into. That is the real task for a foundation today, I think, to make sure that we're just being as disciplined, as targeted, as f and focused and flexible as we can be. So we, we have to be realistic in what we can achieve, but uh, we have lots of opportunity to really to make a difference. What's inside Louise Richardson as she looks at this next challenge? I am so looking forward to it. Yeah, I, th I expect I'm going to discover all sorts of extraordinary people out there doing amazing work. And so my task will be, how do we help them do more of it? I can't imagine anything that's more fun than that. Louise Richardson, congratulations uh, as you begin your tenure as the 13th president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you Thank so much, Judy. Thank you.